Welcome to this session and to this talk. Um, Hans-Christoph Steiner is going to uh, give you a talk on WIND, uh, off-grid services for everyday people. And uh, it will be a network-related talk, and I'm very happy to welcome him on stage. Give him a warm hand uh, of applause. Thank you. Um, so uh, I will be talking about uh, our project WIND, which you just said, about really uh, our work over the last seven-ish years about integrating offline connectivity with kind of nearby networking into the internet and making that something that you can use transparently. Um, I'll give a little uh, overview of some kind of randomly chosen or not so randomly chosen, uh, historical precedents that I think uh, inform this whole discussion, talk about some of the work that, well, a lot of the work that we've done, and other examples um, that have presented on, been presented at Congress and other places, and um, also it hopefully inspire everyone here who works on software of any kind, uh, maybe even hardware, to um, also think about uh, nearby and offline networks and how to in integrate it into what, um, what you're making. Um, so uh, this work is kind of under the umbrella of the Guardian project. Uh, we are a, a free software project focused on privacy in mobile. Uh, we, we make, uh, that means, um, when we do software development, we started with the idea that we want to make apps where uh, privacy comes first. We don't want to compromise at all on privacy um, as in the whole process. Um, include, so that means, you know, we haven't become rich and famous uh, because we've opted for grants rather than VC money and things like this. Um, us, one central idea for us is that, uh, that, that the design, the usability of software um, does not, uh, is not in, in conflict with privacy, but really an, actually an essential uh, part of delivering software that is actually uh, secure and private. Um, if people don't understand what they're doing, then they're much more likely uh, uh, to make a mistake. And, and if you uh, design things in a way that it's e they have to, the user has to choose between the dangerous button and the safe button right next to each other, then, then that can cause a lot of problems. Um, so central to our design um, process is really thinking about user experience. So this is, you, you, instead of saying, um, you know, the user didn't understand it, we need to write a manual better, we need to teach them better, we say, no, we need to make it so that the software matches the people's expectations. We need to present it in a way that the expectations are clear, um, and this means a lot of talking to people, a lot of uh, iterations, and a lot of trial and error. Um, so, uh, Guardian Project Game specifically focuses w the users we've focus on um, are from activists and citizen journalists um, and human rights defenders, people, you know, anything from like election monitors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we are often called upon to help uh, inform software that's used in businesses or, or, or business people who travel use, use our software. Um, and frontline reporters, um, and uh, one, but really, you know, so the core mission was we really want to make privacy and, and, and these kind of things uh, uh, something for everybody. Uh, and we've kind of found this niche where we can um, work in partnership with all sorts of organizations uh, who, want, who will give us money to focus on these people like uh, human rights activists. Uh, and that we develop free software and we try to push it out there in ways that it can be uh, reused, both in terms of free software libraries, uh, so that you can incorporate that into your, um, into your apps, uh, but also in terms of design research, design patterns, and things like this. Um, so these are 
just a bunch, um, some of the, not all, but some of the partnerships. Uh, these are, you know, a lot of these organizations represent, say, the target user. Uh, that, and, and so whenever we're designing software, we're always working in conjunction with, directly, with people who are, have strong privacy concerns that we're trying to address, uh, and other, you know, accessibility. And we also um, always try to find, you know, if there's already a free software project out there doing an essential part of what we're doing, we would much rather try to support another free software community than invent it ourselves. So this means we have to do a lot more talking as well. But um, so that's part of coming to an event like this is to say, okay, you know, where where are the parts that we all can work together and make something better? Um, yeah. So I should also mention that you know I I kind of wear man, many hats in in the, this is the I pay my bills usually through officially Guardian project, but I. But the way we work is that we, uh, we op often do a lot of the work just because we think it's important. I'm also a Debian uh, developer. I'm also a core team of F-Droid and other things like this, um, things that don't necessarily pay the bills. But be because we have some funding here, it means we can also have time to focus on, on things that integrate into the whole thing and are also really important. So networks. Um, so everyone's familiar with the internet, and the internet is uh, now on our phones and in our pockets all the time. Uh, and I think more and more people are forgetting that there used to be lots of lots of all sorts of kinds of networks out there. Uh, and that I think it's, so I wanted to highlight a couple that were influential to me, and also just to point out that, you know, there's, there's things we can we can learn from them because some of these ideas people think, well, that's crazy to build a system like this. That, you know, it's too hard. Well, and you can look back and say, well, actually, this was working pretty well not so long ago. Um, who, who here has heard of FidoNet? Some, okay. FidoNet is probably my, f yeah, is my, real, my first exposure to anything like a network. Uh, what it is, <laughs> quite simply, was uh, back in the days when you know, a connection to a network was a modem um, and dialing into something, um, there was a thing called a BBS. It was basically a one-stop, I mean, it was one computer that lots of people could call into, and you could exchange, you know, you could chat, you could find files, things like this. Uh, so a bunch of people figured out, well, you know, if we want to exchange data to across the country, that's a very expensive phone call. But I can call, make a local call for free, uh, or cheaper, and then that person, that BBS can make another local call, and that BBS can make another local call, and, it can, and then we can have a global network that's actually affordable. Um, and uh, that's this FidoNet spanned um, a large part of the world. I mean, it went from US to Bulgaria, uh, I think a little bit into South America, um, and just you know, organized by people who wanted to be able to send little emails and things like this. Um, then, uh, for me, one that's near and dear in my heart, anyone ever use beam, beaming apps and, and Palm Pilots? Right. So this is something I think is quite important. This is like, it has the idea of uh, offline nearby networks built in from the beginning. Uh, anything in as far as I remember, like the, you know, if you, you had an app, you could beam an app to someone else. You'd be like, hey, here's this app. You want this app? Uh, and you point the devices and made a little noise. Um, you could also beam contacts and things like this. And it, it actually worked pretty well. And it was just based on like the same little infrared sensors as a rem TV remote control. And, and I think that it worked because of the technology was there. But the, the, more importantly, I think, is that they got it smooth enough and this kind of interaction, we're already talking about like, oh, give me your card or pull out your thing and pull out your Palm Pilot and point them at each other was already kind of plugging into an existing human behavior. Uh, so it wasn't telling people to do some totally new weird thing. Um, one thing that's getting a lot of uh, media attention right now is uh, El Paquete Semanal, the weekly package in Cuba. Uh, which is really a pretty amazing network of 
couriers moving hard drives around Cuba. Um, <laughs> what it is is, uh, is so someone either um, goes to a country that has high-speed internet, uh, or they have, through some source, they get it on, on Cuba. So for, I mean, for people who don't know, most of Cuba doesn't really have internet access, and the internet access that is available is extremely expensive. So people have figured out this thing. Well, they just buy a hard drive, and they fill it up with e-books, movies, all sorts of things, apps, games, uh, and then someone brings it into uh, Cuba. They have a whole network of, this is a network that's of people who talk to each other and meet up, and they physically exchange these hard drives. So someone says, oh, I got the new weekly packet. You go, you have your weekly packet store. You know someone that gets, who gets it from someone. You go make your copy, then people say, oh, okay, I want to get apps. They go to the weekly packet store. They pay a little money, you get some time on the hard drive, copy what you need. Um, and this covers Cuba quite well. Um, and there is no actual, there's no wireless networking, there's no, uh, there's no wired networking. It is people moving hard drives around um, and, and talking to each other and, um, and agreeing. <laughs> um, and I mean, so this was, has often been kind of derided as a sneaker net, uh, which is something near and dear to us. I mean, the, the, uh, and as something as a, a last resort. Um, but it turns out that sneaker net is still the fastest way to transmit data. So Amazon has a service where if you have a lot of data and you want to move to Amazon, they drive a truck. They drive a truck to your, to your data center, and they plug it in, and you load it up. Um, and this is an exabyte of data. And I mean, I, I don't know all the exact details, but something like an internet, for one example case, it would have taken 26 years to do it over the internet, and it took them six months with this thing. Um, so it's just really a truck full of wired hard drives. Um, and then, uh, I feel like, so this is more, I feel like mesh is, is fading a little bit. So this is something that was, there was quite a bit of activity maybe 10 years ago, um, of people building DIY networks that can build, a, uh, figure out how to route data through them, but, um, kind of on their own. And that's the core idea of a mesh network. Um, and... So this specific map is uh, the uh, Guifi network in uh, Catalonia. Uh, you can see like the, that is Barcelona where the mouse pointer thing is. Uh, but so it covers quite a large area. I think it's 10,000 nodes. Um, and to this it's provided actually uh, relatively high speed networks in a place where the, the local telecom companies haven't really been interested for whatever reason. Uh, in doing it, um, and uh, there's there's actually a kind of a, it's kind of a hard thing. So the you know this is built by and set up by a uh, whole lot of volunteers, and that takes a lot of uh, people's time and technical ability. Uh, and what often happens in the in cases like this is that then. Uh, they've done the hard work of actually proving that people want the internet and maybe will even give some money to it um, to support it. And then the companies often come in and be like, oh, look, that's a market waiting for us. And then poof, and these things go away. Uh, there's another recent, I just learned about it um, yesterday. I mean, the, well, the, the outcome, but there's a telecom in eastern Nicaragua called Seisel, a uh, very similar idea, kind of. DIY community-based effort because the, the local telecoms were not interested in eastern Nicaragua at all. Um, they set it up, got it working, and then the telecoms saw, oh, wait, people will actually pay for telecom service there. And then they, of course, then set up a giant, uh, lots of towers and put Taysail out of business. Um, and, of course, the internet itself started as an offline network that was, you know, 1970, that was the internet, that was all of it. Um, and it, it, this was, you know, built node by node starting, you know, when they first turned it on, it was two or three 
computers <laughs> talking to each other, and bit by bit, it was built out into what we have now. Um, and on top of that, you know, so that, that was a, a US uh, Defense Department really funded effort, uh, but then lots of things started kind of butted on top of that. So Usenet, which is still alive and uh, kicking today, and uh, is a fascinating idea of, of how to move. Uh, so it's basically like forums, um, and it's all organized by topics. And um, in back when it was created, the the internet was not really available, and and people wanted to say, well, we want to use this this these digital media, uh, we don't have access to the internet, how can we do this? Uh, so similar to something like FidoNet, this is computers calling each other, syncing up data, uh, and, and what you get basically is this, so someone, you, you, yeah, like a university will have a complete copy of U Usenet, and then you can connect to them, whichever is the closest to you, and say, well, I'm only interested in this much of it, and sync with them, and then, and then it Syncing includes your putting your responses back in. Uh, that university takes your response and then forwards it to every other connection, and and it spans the world um, in these uh, asynchronous kind of bit by bit connections going in every direction. Um, and uh, a very a more recent one, which. It, to me, I just, it's such a clever hack, both politically and technically. Uh, it's called Touche. In its target, it, it's basically about getting around uh, internet blocking in, in Iran. Has anyone heard of Touche? No, I guess not. Um, so it turns out that so that Iran often blocks aspect, uh, aspects of the internet. Um, satellite TV is very popular in Iran, but the satellites are all operated by, I believe, UAE, the United Arab Emirates, and they don't, those countries don't get along. So, that is a, they, they rec the people who put Touche together recognize, oh, this is an opportunity for us, because ultimately a satellite is, uh, video is just bits. Uh, and it turns out it's a standard format, it's MPEG format, bits, so, uh, there's no one checking that your bits actually are a nice, pretty, playable video. Um, so Touche is a system where they have a cable channel on a satellite run by the UA that's targeted in, uh, it's available in Iran uh, on, one of the, on the main satellites that uh, Iranians use to get television. Um, and if you subscribe to it and uh, you basically, a lot of these little satellite boxes you can download to a th uh, USB thumb drive. So you can just download, stream data to it, and then they have a little app that extracts just like, you know, un unzipping a file, but it's taking data out of uh, MP4. Um, so this, uh, to, to me, the whole thing is just, uh, it, I don't know, such a crazy hack that, that works that I, I, I found it very uh, inspirational. <coughs> So, so then why, why do we now really uh, want to think about incorporating offline and nearby networks? Like, you know, there's all these things before, that was the only way, or there was, there was a direct need. And now it feels like, well, it's so easy for much, so much of the world to just get stuff on the internet. Um, <coughs> companies like, like Google, have really pushed this idea that look, they can provide always connected services, and you know when they when you're always connected, then they can run these huge servers and have these insane search indexes and all this stuff that you can't do in a or no one's been able to do in a decentralized way. So you know they they they're so invested in this model of always connected internet everywhere. They're flying balloons. Um, Facebook as well. You know they have their idea of putting drones up to beam internet, always connected to internet around the world. Um, and to me, this, I, I'm, I've always been very fascinated in the history of uh, computers and the internet, and it reminds me of a one, I think, often overlooked, but very important story in the, um, in the, fam uh, in the roots of the internet and, and computing. Uh, and that is, uh, a lot of this, 
stuff like the internet was, ha was being built around when the Vietnam War was uh, being fought. And while we usually think of uh, like a lot, you know, oh, the internet was a bunch of hippies making internet access or uh, information available for free, uh, that, that, there was, that, w that was happening. At the same time, the people who actually were funding this, the people in charge of the defense Depar U.S. Defense Department funding, had a very different idea. Their idea was about, well, if we have a nuclear war-proof network that spans all everything, then we can have th the most efficient centralized command control possible. We can build a network where every th all, we have people taking care of everything, and then when it'll be so efficient that the president can actually decide who, which person to shoot. Well, they'll just be able to flip on a monitor, and the airplane will be flying in the air, and the president gets to pull the trigger. This is, this is, this is really... This is not a made-up story. This is really part of what they were thinking about. Um, one of the things that they did, so in, the, in that time, so in about 1970, the largest computer in the world was in Thailand. Um, because they had built a network all up through Vietnam um, and uh, Laos and Cambodia, uh, where the Ho Chi Minh Trail was. This is where the Vietnamese brought weapons from the north down to the south to fight. Um, so they, they, were, they, they had this idea, well, we'll just build a network over the whole thing, we'll wire up sensors and video cameras and audio sensors, and then we'll know where every, everything that's happening on this, uh, on this trail. Uh, and then when we want to, uh, you know, blow up some truck or something, there you, there you go, the, the general can sit there and be like that one. And we'll have perfect knowledge. Um, and uh, that, and uh, so huge amounts of money, largest computer in the world. They built the system, and it was reporting all these statistics about all the things that they have killed and blown up. Um, here they have a nice map of all the places that it had, that were um, targeted via this system. Um, and then after a while, someone tallied all the numbers that they had of all the trucks and airplanes and everything that they, and people they had killed with this, and they realized that it was much larger than any of the estimates from the departments who just were trying to estimate the size of the, the military. And then in, after the war, you can now see this in, in, in museums in Vietnam, the Vietnamese have figured out, oh, here's a microphone, and when it hears a truck, someone shoots at it. So they just played recordings of trucks. <laughs> uh, uh, so this, this was really, they had centralized command and control. They built this amazing infrastructure, internet, up on the whole, you know, in this rural thing in a war, um, and they were victims of their own information bubble. Um, <laughs> so, more directly, what, why do we need uh, offline and nearby networks? Well, what we have is, is centralized, very, and getting, seems to me, even more so. Um, it, it, in some places, in many places in the world, it's very fragile, and pretty much any place in the world, it can be fragile in, in, in surprising times. Um, I worked in Lower Manhattan at, during September 11th. There was no internet, no phones, no cellular phones for weeks. There was no power. There were power lines this big in the street. <laughs> uh, so this, this can happen, you know, in the middle of New York City. Uh, in a lot of the world, it's expensive. Um, it's getting, you know, easier and easier to censor it. Uh, it is, everyone knows it's being surveilled in so many ways. Um, and, and, of course, it, it's, lots of people are trying to push it to not be, um, to not be neutral, like have, to prefer certain services over others. So, uh, it's also not evenly distributed. Um, <clears throat> so this is a map of, of the world where, uh, based on um, percentages of people using the internet, uh, very unevenly distributed. Um, and so part of why that is, well, it turns out that it's quite expensive in certain parts of the world, uh, and often in those parts of the world um, where people don't make a lot of money. 
Um, so really, I mean, affordability is a huge uh, block to getting on the internet in a lot of places. Um, I mean, this is something that Facebook has figured out with their internet.org program. They basically figured out that, you know, if it's worth it to them to pay for the internet bills for people around the world to access Facebook. Uh, but then, of course, they don't pay for the internet, internet bills as a whole, just accessing Facebook. Um, there's even, I mean, another example of a project that we worked on. Um, so in the U.S., the, you, there are large parts of the U.S. where people are that uh, do not have coverage. Um, for example, farms, a lot of large farming areas. And so we worked with a group of, um, representing farm workers in Georgia. Um, the, <coughs> um, we were helping them track uh, the work that they did so they could get paid fairly. Uh, and for the most part, um, they did not have access to the to mobile connections or the internet. Um, this is in, in Georgia, not hardly the most remote remote parts of the U.S. Um, there's also lots lots of places in the world. So here's an example of Syria, where there's actually the internet out. You know, the, the connection to the world outside of Syria is pretty tenuous. There's Tartus basically has three connections, and then there's one in Aleppo, and that's it. And in some countries, they've designed them deliberately like this. So Libya, after the fall of Gaddafi, they uh, were able to kind of go in uh, and look at how the telecom was built. It was built for, to have one central building that could control every aspect of telephones and internet. Um, and another nice example were these... Uh, in Hong Kong, um, these protests that broke out and they were they occupied this um, causeway. So it's kind of a, not a very unexpected thing to be, have tens of thousands of people in, in, a, um, in a highway. Uh, and there was a lot, of, they were trying, it was, it was political demonstrations, they were trying to get themselves heard uh, and they had put a lot of effort into trying to communicate and uh, also keep abreast uh, with what the police were doing. Um, and there was quite a bit of attention um, about, uh, oh, I forgot the name, there is a, there is a service of uh, a chat app that um, had a, a remote, what? No, this one was specifically about uh, having a local connections. Fire chat, yes, thank you. <laughs> Fire chat, uh, and it, it got a lot of publicity here. But it, um, and that one was quite interesting because it actually it worked as a regular chat app. But if if you couldn't uh, connect on the in internet, it would you could also try via Bluetooth to to send messages through the network. Um, so it's it's a nice model of saying, okay, well, internet if you have it, and uh, ad hoc mesh if you don't. Uh, so, now, I mean, these are a lot of nice ideas and uh, hard technical issues. H how can we do this? Uh, that's part of the question that we've been working with. Um, our most recent work has been related to um, uh, a Mozilla um, competition around uh, offline networks. And we um, started, uh, we chose to focus on Latin America. Um, and uh, to kind of be broaden our horizons. Um, and we started out, we had, we had done some work over the time, we started out uh, with some surveys to get some ideas of, of what, what were the issues, like uh, what were the concerns about people. So these are the respondents from these countries of, uh, that we uh, talked to. Um, then we're just trying to get some general ideas about, you know, when you're using a phone, um, you know, what are, what are the problems that you have? Um, and uh, so the, the cost of data was number two, <laughs> and batteries number, number one. Uh, so we had come at it with a perspective very much thinking that uh, what we had heard, I, we, probably, we had just learned a lot about our kind of how expensive it is, to use phones in a lot of parts of the world, and, we, and that was our focus. So then we were surprised to see, oh, actually, yes, that's a concern, but battery time 
is, is the number one. Um, so uh, from, from this, also we say, you know, how much data do people use? Um, so two gigabytes or less is about half the people that responded, so not, not so much. Uh, and then um, how much do they pay? Uh, so most of the people were paying more than $20 a month, uh, which, you know, in the EU is not so much money. In a lot of places, that's a, that's a lot of money. That's you know, a substantial portion of their income, so about 10% of a lot of people's income. Um, so, and from this, we, so we did a lot of interviews and things like this, and uh, we, we also, so we wanted to, we find that having real stories is very informative to the process, but there's a lot of privacy concerns to that. Actually saying, oh, can we interview and spread your, your story about your concerns around the world? So what we did actually was, based on our uh, surveys and interviews, uh, we put together fictional people, um, and these are three of them, uh, and try to keep them um, close, you know, close to what we were hearing. Um, and so these are, uh, these, uh, I think there's eight or ten or so, all available on, on the OK Thanks website. It's linked on the, uh, the talk page. Uh, and it just kind of tells a little bit of their story, their, their phone, their income, and things like this, uh, what apps they use, uh, and um, what they do with the phone. Uh, and these were, very, uh, for us, very helpful in thinking about what, how to prioritize things. Um, you, you know, battery, we had to, we put more effort into battery conserving. Um, then, based on that, we went back, uh, we've, uh, the longest running piece of this work is in f uh, where we started in about 2012 um, with this, what we then called swap, uh, app swapping. Um, and uh, from there, we've tried to think about so Afteroid is an app store. It's all about getting a blob of data from somewhere to your device so you can use it, um, you know, whether it's an app, a video, a ebook, or whatever. Um, so in Afteroid, we, we really have this opportunity to think about, like, well, what are all the useful ways that we can move blobs of data from here to there? And how can we get them all into one user experience where you don't really have to be aware, you don't have to say, well, I have to set up, I have to, you know, oh, the internet's not working, I have to set up um, the Bluetooth connection in a special way so that I will be able to use it. We, so we wanted, or mirroring, or blah, 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 blah. So it's, to, it's and this is really taking shape more and more. Uh, I mean, uh, on, on the left there you have so, some of the many ways that um, that data gets transmitted in the in the FDroid ecosystem. So of course you have you know, up top is fdroid.org. It is there by default. You open up the phone with the internet device, is search for an app, install it. Um, if all is the internet's working fine, it will just download it from there. Um, in each uh, in in the um, fdroid.org can declare, well, I'm also available here in this mirror. Um, you, you know, if you cannot reach fdroid.org, you can try the uh, repo on this server. Um, so that's available in there, but the client knows to say, okay, I can't connect to this one. It's been, uh, so what's the next in the list? And we'll try that, and it'll keep on trying. And then users, if you want to set, if you have your own server, you want to set up your own mirror that's closer to you, you can set up your own mirror and add it anyone and share it to anyone. Um, and that same logic applies. Um, you don't, the user doesn't have to know that the main one failed or even, even there's no notification or anything. It just keeps going until it can't find anything. If it can't connect at all, then you're notified. Um, so that still is a centralized server that is fdroid.org is a central community of people. Any, the, uh, everything that fdroid uh, makes is free software, and we try to make it easy for the people to use it. So, for example, there is a Guardian project 
app repository or repo. Um, anyway, you can just kind of subscribe to it. Um, you can send the link via email, click it, and after it says, do you want to add this? Uh, and then that also can have its own mirrors. And you can have as many of these as you want, each with their own mirrors, each with their own uh, setups. Um, and then uh, we have the nearby functionality. So every phone has radios that can talk to each other. There's Wi-Fi radios, there's Bluetooth radios, and these are set up to exchange data. Um, so the Ineftroid has uh, uh, the nearby tab to help you walk you through the process of making a connection. So you can exchange apps, for any app that's, or video or things like this that is installed on your phone, you can make it available uh, and connect to someone else's device. They see it uh, in the regular App Store experience, click install. Um, uh, and also, then there's the problem of, you know, you need to do this procedure, you need Aftroid talking to Aftroid. So if you want to send, say, oh, I have an app I want to send you. I don't have Aftroid. OK, well, I can just send you Aftroid straight. Um, so that's a relatively straightforward thing. Uh, let's see on the left of just saying, OK, well, I'll send you Aftroid first, and then uh, the rest will be much easier to sync up. Um, and then, of course, it needs to also play nicely with other app stores. So most of the world of Android, people are used to only having Google Play, but large parts of the world, uh, many app stores is normal. China, for example, uh, India, other places. Um, and, and for this to be a whole ecosystem, they all have to play nice. Um, so if, uh, you know, if you're getting apps from Play and then you also install F-Droid, then F-Droid will uh, do what it can to, um, to uh, work nicely. It will, you can, of course, then, if you install an app from Google Play, you can, of course, share it on uh, using um, any of these things. Um, and then uh, we recently saw a nice kind of a, a surprising example um, that we, um, someone came to our chat room and just said, oh, by the way, I've set up a store in Cuba. Um, and he, uh, <coughs> so because we we put the effort into the whole tools to make sure that uh, it just if it can talk on a network, it'll work regardless of its whether it's the internet or not. Um, th this man in Cuba decided he was going to open a mobile phone store. Uh, his, and he thought a good way to promote his mobile phone store would be to have a local Wi-Fi access point that you could connect and get free apps. And so that he was on the out edge of town. He said, well, if you come here, uh, you can connect for free to my network. You'll get free apps. And then, oh, if you need a cable or, or El Paquete, I think he does that, then my store is right here. Um, and so this is a kind of interesting, he, this is an interesting model to me because it's, for the most part, it's offline. It is one Wi-Fi access point with a hard drive plugged into it, more or less, uh, and it works. And then every so often, he gets, he syncs with the internet. So it's a kind of like once a week internet connection. And along those lines, um, there's these little things like, all sorts of little boxes that have Wi-Fi and storage in them now. Uh, and uh, this one's called Library Box of Software for it. Um, that, it makes that idea of this kind of occasionally syncing to the internet and having a local store very, very simple and very cheap. Um, yeah, so I also want to point out, like, th we're not the only people doing this work. and. And really, what we hope to see is a lot more, like a lot more people focusing on this kind of thing and doing it in a way where we can inter interoperate. So, Briar's uh, messaging app. There's a uh, talk from last year here at Congress um, from Torsten Grote, uh, which has a, it's a very similar idea. It, it uses the internet when it's available, but it also can do local connections for sending uh, messages. Um, there are this. Uh, we worked a lot with Tibetan activists in Dharamsala in northern India, where a lot of Tibetans are based. They are quite remote, didn't have networks. They've um, set up their own whole systems 
of both a network and um, computer systems that cover their area. Um, then, I mean, what we're seeing now, uh, you know, even the Silicon Valley doesn't have uh, perfect connectivity, so you can get offline maps on things like uh, on Google Maps. Um, and we're seeing, uh, you know, Apple and, and uh, Google now are also pushing this nearby idea. It's, it's uh, I guess, hitting the mainstream. Um, and specifically, so, you know, they have huge engineering resources, which is a wonderful thing to see on that, but they always come, there's, for in the case of Apple, uh, my, they often, you know, make it work really nicely, but then they stick in arbitrary restrictions, like, uh, you know, iTunes is not allowed to do nearby because they don't want you sharing music, <laughs> or, uh, and, and Google, of course, track adds an extra tracking, because that's their business model. Um, and from, from uh, Apple, uh, there's a very important lesson um, to always, when you're th designing systems, think about spam and abuse. This is a, a this is apparently become a, uh, an, a thing in New York where people are doing AirDrop, Apple AirDrop, um, is their nearby service, uh, dick pics. To anyone who's on the subway who happens to have left their, uh, their airdrop in, I guess there's a like, kind of listen all mode. So you, know, you open your phone and it shows you the picture right there, right? <laughs> Less than ideal. Um, and there's also two apps uh, called Share It and Zapia, which have many millions of users, which do ne this nearby sharing quite well, but that's what they look like. And to me, that doesn't look like they're really focused on uh, the nearby so much. Uh, I mean, when they started out, it was very simple and it was all and it worked nicely. And then, it's the same. You know, they're startups. It's the same business model. Now they're trying to track and monetize you with like endless uh, swipey things. Um, so you know, we need to do it uh, another way. This, the if we really want to have something like oh, that's neutral and nearby and working offline. The, it, it's not gonna. It's not gonna come from uh, Apple and Google, and it's not gonna come from the VC startup, fund, VC funded startup. Um, and for uh, uh, to, uh, to highlight really the, uh, w the way we're thinking about it, like what we want to put up first and foremost is is that ultimately we want people connecting to people. Um, and thinking about how people uh, act rather than encouraging them to act in a way that's, that works with your business model. Um, and also uh, putting this into the design of how the protocols work. So this is some early thinking about from Paul Baran, who's in, involved, a researcher involved in the design of the internet. So it's interesting, 1962, he's thinking about you know, centralized networks, decentralized networks, distributed networks. Um, uh, but these all assumed that those points don't move. Um, but people move. And now that, you know, we all have phones, we have to consider uh, that, uh, that movement is always going to be part of this. Uh, so that means at some points, you will have a great connection to the internet. So you can use it. And it, maybe it's that centralized hub and spoke. Other parts, it might be some more decentralized. Uh, and other points, you know, it may be just connected, uh, connectivity to one library box that has specific services that you may or may not need. Um, there's a whole, whole range of things um, that need to be considered if, to make this whole kind of fluid experience actually work. Um, to break it down, I mean, you might, we have these kind of concepts as our um, kind of core. First is what we call a chime. That's the idea. You have to, it has to be discoverable. If someone sticks a little Wi-Fi box there, if, if your device doesn't know how to find it, um, then it becomes, you know, it's quite a bit of work to actually use that thing. Uh, and um, you need something to uh, store uh, data 
uh, in order to have an effective uh, uh, model where, say, you have the once a week internet. Uh, um, you also need a way for people to send their stuff out, to gather and share it out. Um, and, and so, one thing I think is that the most, from the, this most recent work, that is the most generic and reshareable is to actually say, okay, what is the format of data for announcing yourself and a service that you're offering? Um, this is our uh, first draft of such a thing, the wind chime announce protocol. Um, and so this needs to announce, you know, I am available on this Wi-Fi node, so the SSID, BSSID. I am available at this address. Uh, I am available at, you know, whether it's Bluetooth or not. Uh, and this is the kind of service I am providing. And it has to be in a standardized way so that it can happen um, automatically. You, you don't want to present a, a whole list of text, where, you know, many, many, many things to the user that's not going to ever be useful. Um, then we also have uh, this available in an, a library for Android called uh, Ayanda, which just tries to make these core uh, pieces really easy to do in an app. So that's the discovery piece, um, the sending files and the receiving files part. Um, so then the question is, w you know, how can you get started doing this in software that you're working on? And some of it is just a matter of trying, as we've learned, where you know, most of the time you just think, well, you know, if I have a network connection, even if it's just a local network with you know, small nodes, it should just work, right? If I'm on a mesh network, it should just work because it's all the internet. Well, it turns out it's pretty normal to check for specific things that only exist on the internet. And then that ends up being the only thing preventing your software from working in a, in a nearby or offline way. So that's the first thing, just like, well, set up a network of, uh, you know, or get a library box, one node, see if you can talk to it with your app. Uh, you, um, you, does it work without a domain name? So we're used to, you know, ccc.de, but if you just have an IP address, just the sequence of numbers, will your app work? Because that actually, uh, the domain name makes it a lot harder to set up individual lightweight nodes. Um, and then, you know, in the flow of, of using your app, is there data that can, that can be sent and cached in, in, a, in a way that's not, say, leaking private information, um, things like that. And just starting to think about that is the, is the first step of saying, and with a lot of little tweaks, you, a lot of software can work then on, on um, nearby and offline networks uh, without big fancy changes of syncing with Bluetooth and things like this. Um, so, to wrap it up, I just want to say um, that really what we wanted, we know that this is possible, um, so we want to build this network in a way that reflects our values instead of always turning us into a product. Um, and uh, that, and, and we, you know, I, that means building a network that there, there's, will do something useful if the big, provider is not available making it easy. Um, that means building systems that you don't have to ask in advance to set them up. Uh, just, you know, buy the 30 euro TP link, turn it on, and it should work. Um, in, in some form, you know, there's lots of things like official things like domain names which help, but it shouldn't be essential. Um, and then, Thinking a lot about, you know, well, how can we keep this affordable? I mean, affordable, uh, affordable, accessible, and without any kind of arbitrary things like, well, you can sync anything you want, just not iTunes songs. Um, uh, so uh, affordability, then, you know, it might feel like, well, you know, it's less important here, but when the system, um, is made up of affordable little bits, that gives you a lot more flexibility in how you actually you build it. So it, it really applies kind of everywhere. Um, and in closing, just to uh, 
leave a little something that inspires us is these are these starlings in um, in England uh, that every night gather and just fly around in these swarms of these self-organizing swarms uh, which are uh, you know, many different individuals, some leading, some following, the leaders change. It's very, I highly recommend watching, the videos are amazing of these, of these birds. Um, and it's, if we can make networks with that kind of fluidity of organization, then that would be quite an amazing thing. Thank you. Thank you, Hans Christoph, for your talk. Um, and we have still some time for questions. If you have to leave, then do so quietly. And uh, we have two microphones, one over there and one in the middle. And of course, the signal angel. Just line up and uh, I will call you to ask your questions. <laughs> Don't forget to be quiet while walking out. Maybe a little show of hands if somebody wants to ask a question but cannot reach it because there are people standing in front of the mic. Yeah, yeah. there. Okay. Just walk up to number two that's sitting right over there. And go ahead. Yeah, so you talked about the Barcelona case uh, where they have some kind of a meshed network already as far as I understood. And you, told, uh, and you told us that probably the telco providers will come there and take take like the, the piece of cake there and build their own business model there. But what are the limitations? So why is it possible? Because I think if the infrastructure is already there, it should be cheaper to maintain it than, than to pay extra for the telco providers. Um, okay, so this, you're talking about the Nicaragua case? No, uh, for example, the Barcelona case. Oh, the Barcelona case. Um, so. Well, the problem is, you know, if you have a com company, if you have good competition, and they can build the networks cheaper and maintain them and, and you know, do them in a way that's with net neutrality and things like this, that's great. But, the, but it, I think part of the motivation in Catal Catalonia is that they don't have much network competition. And in Nic Nicaragua, very much so. There's, two comp there's a Spanish company and a Mexican company, and that's it. They're huge. Uh, and so that these companies don't, are not responsive to what people want to do and often put arbitrary restrictions and things like that. Does that answer your question? Or well, I was kind of wondering why it's not competitive. To, why, why like the, uh, the oh. independently built infrastructure is not competitive? I, I think in the case like of Nicaragua, the telecoms really, they have lots of money. They really don't want anyone to have a set a precedent of being effective competition. And so they were like, oh, they're actually getting subscribers, let's crush them. I mean, they're monopolies, they're huge, huge monopolies. I mean, it's, it, it's, you know, that's, that's part of it. So I think it doesn't matter the cost, really. They don't want people getting the idea that they can start competition. Okay. And, Thanks. And, and, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, microphone number one. So you currently focus on mobile technology. Do you consider the desktop or the laptop out of scope uh, because it's irrelevant or just because you want to make it a feasible project? Um, so for the general idea as a whole, absolutely, it's fully in scope. And yeah, we want to okay. see that. Uh, me per personally and Guardian Project as a kind of organization, we our development work is on mobile. And that's why this was have such a mobile bit. But we'd love to see desktop and things like this. Okay. Number two, please. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk. I have actually two questions. <clears throat> One is, um, as far as I understood right now, the Bluetooth is the way to go for these decentralized networks, at least what people are doing right now. And uh, what is the biggest thing that we have that people have accomplished uh, until now? Like, what is the biggest? decentralized network, Bluetooth-based, maybe in this chat client or something. And the second question is, you mentioned a lot of um, technical problems that happen. And um, so how does the routing actually work with this Bluetooth stuff? Do you have um, like geo-based routing or do people, everyone knows everyone or, yeah, thank you. Yeah. 
Um, so, yeah, there's a, let me see, start with a simpler question. So we, it's, it's not just Bluetooth, so it'd be Bluetooth, so you can do Wi-Fi just if you have an access point without the internet, that works. Uh, there's also things like Wi-Fi Direct, um, which seems to be, can work nicely, but not always. Um, so really you have to kind of consider all of them if possible, um, and not one, because Bluetooth is often the easiest to connect, but really slow. Um, where Wi-Fi is harder to connect, but much faster. Uh, then the largest, I mean, Usenet is the largest. It's like terabytes of data. <laughs> the way I mentioned with the, the forums copying around. Um, that is generally copied around on the, on the internet. <laughs> um, that's, that's the largest one that I can think of. And the, the last question was, oh, routing. Um, so that's... I think for a lot of so the really what <coughs> the this wouldn't really be on the kind of transport layer where you're thinking about routing. Um, the the idea more is to say like well so if you want to do ad hoc routing then you would build a mesh network because mesh networks are all about mat ad hoc routing. Uh, FireChat does some I believe they do some ad hoc routing in a very small scale in Bluetooth, and some of that I think is. is freely available, if I remember. Um, and it, so really the idea is more that, um, so like in the case of F-Droid, I think is easiest, uh, is that you make, we, there's a system where so we have a concept of a repo, which is a collection of apps, and et cetera, et cetera, files. Uh, and it has a kind of a globally unique ID. It's the signing key. Uh, so that means when the client encounters some files, it can easily identify it as, oh, it belongs, I know this is fdroid.org because it's the matching signing key. Um, and it can just say uh, wherever it, it, as long as it can talk to these files, um, I mean, what I'm, then it can exchange data. So there's no routing there. Um, if, if it's on a mesh network and it gets an IP address on that mesh network and it gets to the same files, the index knows. Um, so it's about, in the app, you have to think about, okay, how, what are the things we need to discover? What are the bits we need to move around? Um, and how can we do that in a way that's um, reusable? You know, it's very easy to just connect to the inter internet and say, oh yeah, use this domain name, assume it's always there. Um, and I think for that, for, so after is one example, I think Briar is probably a very good example where they're integrating internet and Bluetooth and local Wi-Fi um, to do messaging. Okay, just to check, is there a question from the internet? No questions from the internet. So then, number f uh, two was there before. Uh, um, one of the things that I noticed is that you're talking about apps and uh, F-Droid and distributing apps and then connecting to local nodes. Uh, what about IPFS, that, and, uh, uh, and some of the other distributed networks? Have you, I'm sure you looked into those. And you were talking in the beginning about like integrating with uh, other uh, initiatives like Matrix and so on was on the slides. Can you talk about that? And, and yeah, uh, um, IPFS for people who don't know is interplanetary file system. The idea of one file system that is accessible all over the world. Um, I think IPFS is a great example for this kind of thing. Um, and we would love to integrate it. It's just, it's only so many hours of the day in the day question, really. Um, we, we've been focusing, well, so right now, uh, I mean, it's something we'd, I'd very happily, if someone knows IPFS and wants to try and integrate it into something, I would happily work with them. Uh, we, my f personal focus is, is on the lower hanging fruit, I think, or at least from my perspective, based on what I know, and that's like um, some of the mirroring stuff, some of the um, like the library box, local internet free box, uh, the Bluetooth. So that's based on my, or the pool of skills and interests of the people who've done the work. Um, that's part of what I hopefully am trying to, you know, what I'm conveying here, which is that this needs to be decentralized in effort. There's so many ways and, and, and it's like, okay, how can we find ways to tie all these things together uh, and make it so that, you know, <laughs> messages can go from uh, a Bluetooth mesh over the IPFS to then the centralized internet and back and, and work without people thinking about it. 
Okay, unfortunately, our time is now up. So uh, find uh, Hans Christoph here at the Congress if you have more questions uh, later at uh, any place around here, I guess. Yes. So, and um, yeah, let's give a warm hand of applause for Hans Christoph. Thank you. Thank you.